There we go. Hi, everybody. <laughs> We're going to figure this out. We're having some tech challenges today, but that is because I'm operating with one arm. So <laughs> welcome to terrible timing. Um, Connie Knox wanted to tell everybody I got uh, fought off a bear because I told her about a t-shirt my mom bought me. But no, I just slipped and fell. It's a stupid, stupid excuse. <laughs> So, um, so I'm Krista Cowan. For those of you who don't know me, I am the corporate genealogist for Ancestry. Some of you may know me as the barefoot genealogist from the Ancestry YouTube series by the same name. And I am, in fact, barefoot. Um, it started a long time ago, and I, I'll tell you the story briefly because I love a good story. Um, way better than the slip and fell story. <laughs> Um, I was wearing a long skirt, as I am wont to do, and I was wearing shoes, as I am no longer wont to do. And I was talking around the stage, because I prefer to move. Today I'm going to stand still, <laughs> but normally I'm moving around a lot. And I took a step back to point at something on my slides, and my heel caught the back of my skirt. And then I almost stumbled, and so I stepped back again, and my other heel caught the back of my skirt, and my skirt fell to my ankles. I just bent over, picked it up, and kept talking. <laughs> and have never worn shoes to present again. Because <laughs> at least my feet can feel what's happening. Um, so, so yeah, so that was one of the, the genesis of uh, the speaking barefoot thing. Um, today we're going to talk about what's new at Ancestry. And I'm super excited about this. I get to do this presentation every year. It's one of my favorites to give because I get to share kind of what, what we've accomplished over the course of the last year since the last Roots Tech, and then give you a little bit of a sneak peek into some of the things that are coming in the coming months, and so that's exciting. However, uh, for most of our presentations here at Roots Tech, uh, we're going to do some deep dives into some of these things. So I'm going to fly past a couple of them, but I will be sure to note which ones have other full presentations about them, because I don't want those of you who showed up here to be shortchanged in any way. Now, um, I shared this slide this morning if you were in the general session. One of the things that a lot of people don't realize is that Ancestry has actually been around since 1983. In 1983, we were a book publishing company. Uh, we published genealogy books, so our roots have always been in family history. Um, in 1983, I was 11. <laughs> So I was not around from the beginning. In 1996, Ancestry went online as Ancestry.com. And within six months, I became a customer. And I have been, so I've been a customer from almost the beginning. Now, how many of you, by show of hands, in the room, how many of you have been doing genealogy since before online? Oh, hi, friends. So you understand the old days. Okay, the, the, the tedium and the writing away and the having to be patient, waiting for return letters, and some of us still engage in some of that because I know this might shock some of you who are new, but not everything is online. Thank you for the appropriate gasp. Okay, so not everything is online, um, but the amount of stuff that is online is kind of staggering when you start to think about it. And we'll talk a lot more in this session about content specifically and what is being digitized and coming online and when and how and how you can find it best. So when I started, um, there were only a few databases online, but Ancestry had a goal from the beginning um, and for the first, mm, almost 10 years of our existence as a company, we published a new database on the website every day. Every work day, there was a new database online in those early years. And that was easy because there was a lot of readily available content that we were able to get our hands on. Um, of course, we were a new company, and so a lot of people didn't know who we were or what we did. And it's, you know, you can't just waltz into an archive and say, hi, we'd like to take your precious documents and digitize them and put them online. And the response often in those early days was, you want to do what with huh? And, and who are you? <laughs> okay, um, Because online in 1996, 97, 98, 99, that was new cutting edge technology. Then in 2012, Ancestry launched Ancestry DNA. And people were like, you want to do what with my what and put it where? 
and that was cutting edge technology. And now, we're kind of on this cusp of a new thing, if you heard Steve's presentation this morning in the general session, with artificial intelligence. And some of you are going, you want to do what with what? And it's going to go where? And it's going to do what? And, and there's a little bit of suspicion always about new technology. But I hope that you've kind of learned to trust the process. With as many of you in the room that raised your hand that you've been around this for a while, I hope you've learned to trust that the internet became a thing. <laughs> it worked out for us. <laughs> and DNA became a thing. And it worked out for us. And so I hope that the responsible way that we've used those things lends itself to some trust in the responsible ways that we're, we're using artificial intelligence as well. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Okay, the ancestry, um, new, the new ancestry tagline, if any of you have seen some of our new commercials, is it's a family thing. And I know that that might sound like, well, duh, <laughs> right? Of course it is, it always has been. But one of the things that we've discovered in years of research is that a lot of people come into family history and it becomes a solitary thing. How many of you sit alone at your computer at 2 a.m.? That is way too many of you. I sit at my computer at 2 a.m. on Sunday nights, but I'm not alone. My dad, who's sitting here on the front row, by the way, if you would like to come meet him, he's a lovely gentleman. My dad lives in Oregon. I live here in Utah, and every Sunday night we get on FaceTime. And so I have him propped on a little phone stand in between my two computer monitors, and we work on family history together. And it's lovely that we're able to do that, and I get that I'm lucky that I'm able to do that. But one of the things that I hypothesize is that we all have somebody somewhere who would love to work on family history with us. Because here's something that I've heard way too often in my family. Oh, well, we don't need to worry about that. Krista's doing it. Even my dad, when he was facing retirement a few years ago, and trying to figure out how to get back into family history, approached me very tentatively, and he said, I know you've got this, I know you're like, but I would love to figure out if there's something maybe I could do, if you could show me, like, really hesitant to step into that space, because, oh, you've got this. But over the course of the last eight years, six years, seven, I don't know, eight, eight years, he knows better than I do, over the course of the last eight years that we've been doing this, every single Sunday night, We've only missed four times, I think, in eight years. Every single Sunday night. I said that, I started crying, you clapped, it almost covered it up. <laughs> um, nope. <laughs> um, over the course of those eight years, we have discovered that there is room enough for both of us to be engaged in this work. There's enough things for us to do, but somebody has to coordinate that effort. And so those of you who are here, your role in family history may need to shift a little bit into a coordinator instead of just sitting by yourself at your computer at 2 a.m. Because if your family thinks you've got it, they're gonna let you keep doing it, but they're gonna miss out on the things that they could do. And so Ancestry's introduced this new concept, and this is our um, new thing this year. This is brand new. Uh, it hasn't even, I think, been rolled out fully globally yet. So if you don't have it yet on your account, it is coming. Um, this is available on all Ancestry accounts. So if you have an LDS subscription, if you have just the US subscription, if you have no subscription, you just have an, a free registered guest account because you took a DNA test or because you used to have a subscription and you let it lapse, all accounts have access to family groups, okay? It's a free part of the ancestry service, essentially. And here's what family groups are gonna allow you to do. You can create a group of people in your family who are working on a common goal. And you decide how that looks. You get to decide how you organize that. So in my family, um, I am creating this family group with my dad and I, and we're inviting my mom. <laughs> I love my mom. She's probably watching right now. Hi, mom. Um, 
my mom's a little technologically challenged. Um, she, I don't know what it is. I think her fingers are magnetized differently than other people's. So sometimes she like swipes on her phone or clicks on something on her computer and ends up, I don't even know where or how she got there. Um, but my mom is, she's a brilliant photographer. She's, she creates gorgeous art with her photography. She also understands how to organize photos, how to label photos. And she sat in the Ancestry office. We do employee scanning days where they let us use the scanners and bring in our own pictures. It's the coolest perk ever. Um, and I set my mom up a couple years ago with the scanners at Ancestry and just had her scan all of our old family photos. Now we're gonna talk in just a minute about what Ancestry is doing with that, but one of the jobs she could do is upload those photos and put in the, the labels of who it is and what they're doing. And so I've shared my tree with both of my parents, but now we can create this family group that's gonna allow us directly in our feed on Ancestry to see exactly what each other are doing. Because one of the fears that we all have, tell me I'm not alone, is when we share our tree with somebody, they're gonna mess it up, right? Okay, on Ancestry, your tree is your tree. You create it, you own it, you control what happens to it. Even if your tree is public, nobody can do anything to it unless you expressly give them the permission to do that. Well, I've given my dad editor rights to my tree. Apparently, I trust him. <laughs> I've given my mom editor rights to my tree. Very hesitantly. <laughs> And the new activity feed in Ancestry allows you to see who's making what changes, and I can kind of follow along. But now with family groups, we're going to allow you to surface that a little bit easier. You're going to be able to see exactly who's doing what. And as the person who is coordinating the efforts in the family, I can assign people tasks. So I can give my mom a job, a specific job, to go to this branch of the family tree and go upload all the photos we have for the, this family. Or I can tell my dad, you know what, that DNA match we were working on last week, I think it goes here. Can you go look into that and see what you can figure out? Or I can maybe at some point open up my tree to my brother. My brother has guest access. Apparently I don't trust him. <laughs> I can invite my brother who travels quite a bit for work and when he's going to Ohio, I can assign him a task and say, hey, can you go to this cemetery? and take a photo of this tombstone, we don't have it yet. And that's gonna show up in his ancestry feed because he's a part of this family group. And then he, with the magic of the ancestry mobile app that's, that is linked to your online tree, he's gonna be able to see that task in his feed, go to the cemetery, take a photo, and if I give him contributor access to the tree, he can upload the photo directly to the tree. So he can't do it as a guest, and I'm not sure I'm ready to give him editor access. But contributors can upload photos and stories and audio files, and they can add information. So here's what I'd like you to take just a moment and start to think about. If you were to create, maybe get out a piece of paper. Some of you are already taking notes, but maybe get out your notes app or something. I want you to seriously think about this for a minute. If you were to create a family group today, who would you invite, and what kinds of things could you, as the owner and coordinator of this tree, invite people to help you do? Who in your family? Write it down. I want you to write down names and, and what job you think they could do for you. You can. So the question was, I love when random questions get shouted out from the audience. Thank you. The question, no, it's fine. The question is, can you have more than one family group? Yeah. So I only have one tree, and this is where you have to start thinking through what it is you want. So I know, how many of you have just one tree for your whole family? See, you're my people. One tree to rule them all. I've kind of been obsessed with that because I want a singular view of my whole family history. It makes it easier. Eventually something's gonna cross, people are gonna intermarry. I have yet to find a relationship between my parents though. But both of my mom's parents are, have family who've intermarried and both of my dad's parents have family who've intermarried. And so it just made sense to keep it all in one tree. How many of you have a tree for mom's side and a tree for dad's side? 
Okay, that's a few less of you, okay? So you're kind of working on two sides of your family tree. Anybody have four trees, one for each grandparent? Not a single, per oh, I saw one. Two, okay, two, okay. So three, there we go. Some of you are like, no, I'm embarrassed to admit. No, it's fine, totally fine. Um, however you decide to do it, you have to think that through. Right? You have to think through the repercussions of how you use the technology. And that's true on Ancestry. It's true with any of the other services or, or tools that you use out there. You have to kind of think through what your end goal is and then what's going to best serve that end goal. So in my case, one of the reasons I have one tree to rule them all is because the technology currently is limited in that DNA tests can only be attached to one tree. And so I took a test, I attached it to me in my tree, and I wanted it to be able to work for my whole tree. I didn't want to have to be flip-flopping it back and forth between trees. So that's one reason. I mentioned another reason a minute ago, which is I want a singular view of my whole family history. That's important to me. As I start to share my family tree with my siblings and now my nibblings, that's a word. It's my niece and nephews. That's the word. There is a word. Did you know that word existed? I, it's one of my favorite words. So I am an aunt, and they are my nibblings. Um, as I start to share the family tree with them, I don't want them to have to try to figure out where to go to find what information. I just want to serve it up to them, mostly on their mobile apps right now, because that's where they're at technology-wise. I want to just be able to serve that information up. So I can. I haven't yet, because they're all still just barely young enough. But um, nephew number one, I'm pretty sure, now has the Ancestry mobile app on his phone. Um, and I'm going to create a family group for them. Because another thing you can do in family groups is you can start to add stories. Now last year, in this presentation, I announced Ancestry's Storymaker Studio. This year we have rebranded Storymaker Studio. <laughs> Same product, new features. It's called Memories. So when you're in your Ancestry mobile app, or when you're on the website, look for the little tab that says Memories, and that's what this is. It's, it's the place you're gonna go to create all the stories. It's where you're gonna go to upload photos um, and use some of the tools that we rolled out last year, tools like colorizing and sharpening, but we have some new features. Last year, I announced this, but it wasn't quite ready, and now it's fully functional. We have the ability to record and or upload audio. And so you can just take out your, your phone, open up a picture, hit record, and tell the story of what's happening in that picture. Or record your family members telling the story. And, and you can start to have that audio experience. Because our children, our grandchildren, our nibblings, they live in a very different world than we live in. And the way that they use technology is very different. And so what that means is if we want them to be interested, we need to meet them where they are. We, who was in my presentation this morning? My quick five minutes? Okay, I talked about shoving everybody in the 15 passenger van and taking them for a ride. <laughs> You're gonna hear more about that tomorrow if you come to my presentation. But um, in my head, I have this vision, right, of me driving this van and my dad sitting, well, he, was, he wasn't in the passenger seat, he was sitting behind me. Right? And he had the mobile app, and I'm telling stories, and he's telling stories. And the other you know, eight passengers in that van, they didn't know those stories, but they were so interested. Now, they wouldn't have gone to the effort to figure out those stories, but they wanted to hear them. And so oftentimes the way that I envision it is, we, those of us in this room, those of us online, we're the drivers of the van. And so who are we piling in with us? And are we telling them the stories in a way that is interesting to them? So again, if you're, if you're taking notes, here's a really great moment to just stop and think about what stories do I know that I haven't told yet? And what stories do I know and maybe have told that I haven't recorded in some way? Either audio or written. One of the things that I think every single genealogist in the world, if you ask them their number one regret as it pertains to family history, I mean, and I've asked this question of a lot of genealogists, and it's almost universal, the reply. 
What is it? I didn't get the stories. I didn't talk to them when I had the chance. And now, some of us, I'm looking around the room, some of you are a little bit older than I am. Not much, but a little bit. Now you're those people. And, and are you sharing those stories? I would sometimes roll my eyes so hard at my grandmother. Especially when she would tell the same story multiple times in the same conversation. Because we got to that point. <laughs> but now, with the perspective that I have, I treasure those stories. So your teenager or your young adult or your small grandchild may roll, your eyes, roll their eyes at you. But capture the stories. Get them written down because they will regret that they didn't pay more attention. And you can do something now to make sure they don't have that regret. You're the drivers of the van. So make sure you're recording those stories. So Ancestry is provided this way. In our new memories section on both the app and the website, upload your photos, record the audio stories, type out the stories, upload the documents. We also have in the memories story a brand new functionality where you can create photo albums. Now, I don't know, again, looking around the room, I don't, I'm always never quite sure of my demographic, but how many of you have an Instagram account? Ooh, that's a, way more than I thought that was going to be. Okay, that's awesome. Um, I, uh, every one of my nephews that has an Instagram account, and my niece, I only have one. She's the world's only niece. <laughs> um, they all have Instagram, and they all follow me. So guess what shows up in my Instagram stories every once in a while? Meet them where they are. And what I'm hoping is going to happen, and we're working on this, right, and we've been working on this over the course of the last year, is that I'm going to get them into the Ancestry app, and now instead of having to copy stuff over to Instagram, I can just push out a notification that says, hey, there's a new story. Hey, there's a new audio file. Hey, I asked Nana this question, and here's how she answered it. Hey, you know that photo that's always hanging in my living room that you always ask about? Here's what I know about it. And as I start to push that information out and meet them where they are, on the device that they're on, with the attention span that they have, <laughs> right? I'm just taking them for a little ride. And they have become these passengers along on this family history journey. So that's one of the things that Ancestry has really focused on over the last year, is making these tools easier, more accessible, because we want you to bring your family along on this journey. And so one of the other things that Ancestry has recently done for those of you who have a paid subscription to Ancestry, we have now introduced Ancestry Family Plans. So one of you pays the subscription, and you can have four other people in your family who can have their own accounts with their own logins, and they can come along for the ride with, the, with you. You decide if you want to share your tree with them or not. I would hope that you do. And you decide what level of permission you want to give them Guests can just view, collaborators can upload and contribute, and editors can do anything in your tree that you can do. But what I'm hoping is we'll start to find places of connection where we're collaborating and sharing that information and sharing those stories and making sure that they're not lost. Okay, I'm going to pause right there for just a second and take a drink and ask, are there any questions so far? And raise your hand, I can call on you, I will repeat the question for the at-home viewing audience. Okay, I see one over here and one over here. Okay, so her question was, if we've already uploaded the pictures to Family Search, can we also upload them to Ancestry? Yes, absolutely. If you've uploaded the photos to Family Search, I assume that means you have them on your computer, and then you can just also upload them to Ancestry. If there are photos on Family Search that you did not upload, you just want to make sure you have the rights and the permissions, right? So um, photos that are recent, more recent, um, those are probably still under copyright. And so you want to just make sure that you have the rights or the permission to download those and re-upload them. Um, if they are um, older photos, most of those are out of copyright, but you're still going to want to make sure that you maintain the provenance if it was not your photo. So always put 
in the description when you upload it, who originally uploaded it, where you got it from. Um, and the reason we do that, right, I see lots of arguments online about this, so I'm just gonna squash them right now. It has nothing to do with getting credit. I always see people who complain about this and then they're like, well, I don't care who gets credit. No, like it's not about credit, it's about provenance. If I upload a photo of my grandmother, I know she's my grandmother. And I have stories and information about her that a lot of other people don't. And so I want my name to be maintained on that because I want people to come to me for that information. I also want to know that if it gets attached to a tree somewhere, that they've attached it to the right person. So we want to be really careful about how we use photos from other places. But if they're your photos, by all means, you can upload them anywhere you'd like. Okay, sir, I saw your hand over here. Yeah, so his question was, um, photos you currently have in your tree gallery. So you've uploaded photos already to your tree on Ancestry. Those photos show up in the person gallery on the person page. As a matter of fact, let's see, I don't know if we got this working or not. Nope, it's not letting me flip over to the website. Um, the person gallery on Ancestry um, has now just been rebranded memories. So it's not a different place. So everything that was in your gallery is now in this memories tab specifically, um, and that's where it's gonna be. The other new feature that we've introduced here though is the ability to create albums. So for example, I can go through and I can attach my single photo to multiple people in my tree and then I can say, oh, but I'm gonna create an album of all the photos of people who served in World War II. It doesn't duplicate the photos, it just creates an organized way, again, for those people you're bringing along on this journey with you to just kind of go through and have different ways to consume that content. This specifically, this memories presentation, or this memories um, piece of ancestry is going to be a specific presentation on Saturday morning. So if you're here Saturday morning, you can come and hear more about this, deep dive into this if you have more questions about this. Okay, one last question and then we're gonna move on. Yep, great question. Okay, let me repeat that so everybody can hear. So he's asking about if I've uploaded photos to my tree for my grandfather, and then my cousin uploads photos to his tree for my grandfather, can we see that we each have photos that maybe are or are not the same? Right, that's kind of the, the, kind of the gist of it. Okay, so the idea is yes. Anytime you've got a person in your tree, there's a couple things you're gonna to wanna to do with those photos. First, you're gonna to wanna to make sure you've got that photo attached to the person in your tree. You can upload photos to your gallery for your tree and not attach them to anyone. And I've done that, right? And then I'm hoping to give my mom a job to do. Go through and attach the photos to people, okay? Um, but you can also search photos that other people have uploaded to their tree. Again, we're gonna do a deep dive into this on Saturday morning, so if you're here, um, come back and we can answer more questions about that. Also, Jordan is our product manager over this particular part of the website, and he's gonna be doing booth demos in the Ancestry booth here about it, and you can talk to him and he'll show you. You can pull it up on your device, we can pull it up on the computers in the exhibit hall, and he can walk through that with you. Okay, let's move on and talk about content, because I think this is what a lot of you maybe came for. I don't know, why is my, my slides are now not advancing? Let's try that again. Nope, not advancing at all. Not sure what I did. Okay, well I'm hoping somebody can come help me. This is the challenge of one-handedness, y'all. I could do this a lot faster if I knew what I was doing. Yeah, my slides aren't advancing, so I don't know if there's somebody that can come help with that. Okay, so let's talk about content. So historical record collections on Ancestry. I announced last year that um, from 1997 through the beginning of 2023, Ancestry had published a total of 41 billion records on the website. Now, keep in mind, I have been with the company this month 20 years. That's insane, right? That's like a whole lifetime. Um, 20 years with the company. My first job at Ancestry was content acquisition. So I was responsible for Europe 
and making connections and contacts and contracts to acquire records to publish on the website. My second job at the company was indexing manager. And what that meant was that I was responsible for once the records were acquired and digital images were created, getting those records indexed so that they were searchable on the site. Now, when I started in that role 17-ish years ago now, uh, I was at the time responsible for one of the largest single line item budgets in the company. Because indexing is a not cheap prospect. Like you have to read every census and have a person back in the day key every line of that record, right? And with that, Ancestry was able to index about two million records a month. Now, with the advances in technology, over the course of the last five years, till 2023, Ancestry was indexing an average of two to three million records a day. Okay, wait, it's about to get bigger. With the launch of the 1950 census last year, in 2022, Ancestry uh, developed some proprietary handwriting recognition algorithms and have employed the use of artificial intelligence in order to index records faster, and the quality is pretty on par. Now, there's still some human intervention that's taking place, there's still some tweakings, we're still on the cutting edge of that, right? But the idea is that we are now able to index things so much faster. So one of the record collections that Ancestry introduced this last year is called um, the Newspapers, Stories, and Events Index. So on newspapers.com, Ancestry has a huge collection of newspapers, but you have to go over there to search them. And if any of you have ever searched old newspapers, what are some of the top three challenges you have searching newspapers? OCR, right? So the old way to index newspapers with what is, with is what's called optical character recognition. And that has been a challenge, right? The challenge has been that that is old technology and it has some limitations. One of the limitations of optical character recognition is that it, it depends on the quality of the image. Now, have any of you ever looked at an old newspaper? <laughs> like how is the quality of that image, right? Um, and so the, so the challenge has been that, um, that, that reading the images was difficult. That was number one, OCR. Number two, have you ever read a newspaper article and the woman isn't even mentioned by name? She's just Mrs. John Smith. That's awesome, <laughs> okay? My own grandmother, so my grandfather died when my mom was 17, and when my parents got married a few years later, my grandmother put a wedding announcement in the newspaper, the local Long Beach, California newspaper. I think it's called the Long Beach Independent. And she called herself Mrs. O.V. Woodruff. Those are my grandfather's initials. They're not even her initials. Which brings us to the next problem, which is sometimes people aren't even mentioned by name. They're just mentioned by their initials, right? So researching newspapers has always been a little bit challenging, but one of the, the benefits of newspapers is that it fills in the gaps, right? There are places that did not start keeping birth records at a state level until the 1940s. And so how do you find a birth certificate when grandpa was born in Florida in 1927? Or how do you find a marriage announcement when you're not quite sure whether they got married here or in the state that borders it or two states away because she was underage? <laughs> it happens, <laughs> okay? Um, what about birth announcements, right? Um, so there's, there's lots of different ways that newspapers fill in the gaps for records. And when Ancestry started using artificial intelligence three years ago to go through our newspaper collection on newspapers.com, one of the things that we discovered is that there are tons of marriage announcements, marriage licenses, and obituaries. And so we created a collection of marriage license and obituaries and marriage announcements. And then we discovered there are also everyday stories. Just people going about their business, earning merit badges and Boy Scouts, having dinner at their daughter's house two doors over and playing cards all night, going on a vacation and coming home, going off to war and coming home, 
or not. And all of that information often makes it in the local newspaper. And so there's all these little snippets of stories and events. So over the course of the last year and a bit, we started it in the fall of 2022, and throughout all of last year, Ancestry has gone through the entire newspaper collection at newspapers.com and created a searchable index for over 16 billion records in 14 months. And because we've employed not just artificial intelligence to say this little snippet of an article is about one person and this person is connected to this place and this date, then we can use the algorithms on ancestry to hint and say, hey, you know what, we think this might be related to this person in your tree. Because while she's listed as Mrs. O.V. Woodruff, we happen to know that her husband's name was Orville Vernon because you've got him in your tree. And we happen to know that she has a daughter named Sue. And that daughter got married in 1971. So we think this is a little engagement announcement mentioned in three lines of the Long Beach Independent. And it can hint those out. And so the, the artificial intelligence used to create the index, the artificial intelligence used to hint those out is all being continually improved. But I will tell you right now that I have already made discoveries that I thought I would never make in this particular collection. Now your question is gonna be, how do I access it? I'm just gonna answer it, I'm glad you asked. Um, okay, right now, there are only two, two, well, before today, there were only two ways to access this. One is through hints. So you will get hints, and they will be called the Stories and Events Index. If you've seen those already, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't, that's what that is. They come from newspapers.com. The other way is to actually go to the specific database, meaning California newspapers, Alaska newspapers, Arkansas newspapers, Florida newspapers. Go to the specific database on Ancestry and search. Because there are 18, almost, almost over 16 billion records in this particular collection, we can't put them in the global search. It just starts to cause things to go kind of wonky. <laughs> And so when you do just a general global search of all now 60 billion plus records on Ancestry, they won't come up. So hints, database specific searches, and then as of today, so the team, the content team at Ancestry does amazing things, okay? They pushed to get this page created. So if you go to ancestry.com slash newspapers, you can now have this place to search to access all of these databases. Now, I will tell you right now, because somebody else is gonna ask this question. I'm glad you asked, let me give you the answer. Right now, it's just the US, but we are currently in the process of also doing the same thing for uh, the newspapers on newspapers.com for these other regions as well, okay? So you're gonna be able to find things like the little snippet of an article from 1798 in a London newspaper that gave me the maiden name of a woman I've been looking for for 20 years. Two lines in a newspaper, that's it. And I had looked and looked and looked and hadn't found it and hadn't found it. And now, with a little sneak peek into some things, I was able to make that discovery. So, this is newspapers. Okay, gonna pause, I already see some hands raised. Um, I'll take like three, maybe four questions specifically about newspapers.com. Then we're gonna wrap up with content and some new stuff in DNA, and then another um, announcement about another new set of tools. Okay. Okay. So his question was, if you have a subscription just to newspapers.com and you're searching on newspapers.com, is it getting you the same stuff, basically? And the answer is yes. The challenge is, when you're searching on newspapers.com, you're searching just the, the words on the page. And so you have to get really creative. If you've ever done a search, you know you're searching for Mrs. O.V. Woodruff, Jesse Woodruff, J. Woodruff, Mrs. J, like you're trying all the different combinations on newspapers.com because there you have to get it just right. The benefit on Ancestry is that we've pulled in some of that additional metadata and so we're able to serve that index up with a little bit of an easier process. 
Okay, so newspapers are still doing some incredible things, um, and you do have to have access, uh, a newspaper subscription to access the images of the articles. They all live on newspapers.com. What Ancestry has created is the stories and events index to all of those newspaper articles. So it's a really great way to kind of see if it's gonna be even a benefit to you. Because one of the questions I get asked again is, well, is it, is it gonna have what I need? Is it worth it to get a subscription? My answer will always be yes. But maybe not, right? It depends on where your family lived and if the newspapers exist for that place. So one of the things that you can do, and I, let me see if I can just demo this for you right now because this is super fun. Let's come in here to Arkansas because I always pick on my mom's family. Okay, we're going to come in here to the Arkansas. Here's the Arkansas Stories and Events Index. One of the things that I can do is I can say, you know what, was there ever a newspaper published in Green Forest, Carroll County, Arkansas? And maybe not even that specific count, uh, town, maybe let's just check the whole county and let's see what comes up. And so you can start to do searches, 700,000 search results for the newspaper in Green Forest. Okay, so there's a paper that exists. Does that paper exist? in 1910, give or minus 10 years, right? So from 1900 to 1920, are there newspapers in Green Forest? Hmm, 388,000 records come up, okay? So one of the ways you can search on Ancestry that I love is when you go to a specific database, don't type in a name. Y'all are always searching for names. I need the name, I need the name, right? No, place and time matter just as much. Okay? And so you can do a search, and you can do this on any database on Ancestry. You can do a search directly into the place and time and see if the records you need even exist. And that will tell you if it's valuable for you or not. Now, if you want to get really tricky, you can say, you know what, really what I want to see is everybody in that place and time with the last name of Dunlap, and we're going to click search, and it's going to tell me that there are 353 of them. And now I can start to go through these and decide, are these valuable? And you can see just from the search results that you're seeing on your screen there, look at how many of those are initials only, or husband's names, Mrs. So-and-so, right? Sometimes she gets her first name. But we'll also tell you what kind of an article it is. And this is a new thing that we're kind of playing with, is this idea of human interest. I found a San Fernando Valley, California, newspaper snippet about when my dad earned a Boy Scout merit badge when he was like 14. <laughs> That's cute, <laughs> okay? So human interest. Um, we also have clubs and associations. So if they spoke at their local key club or Lions Club or they're a member of the VFW, or right? Like there's sometimes snippets of things in the newspaper. This is the one you don't wanna see, y'all. <laughs> Law and justice. <laughs> I mean, if you want to know that Grandpa got a DUI, that's where you're going to find it. Um, it also might have information about court trials and arrests and other things. And then there's a category for accidents and emergencies. So anytime, and, and those are the kinds of things, like you have to think about what makes the news, right? Those are the kinds of things that make the news. Um, and then I think our other category is just other right now. But we're constantly, again, working with the AI to figure out how do we refine this because our goal and you guys I know I get to stand up here and be the face of the company and I love you for loving me but I just need you to know that there are hundreds of people who work at Ancestry who are just as passionate as I am about this <laughs> I am so lucky that I get to go to work every day with smart people <laughs> People who are thinking about you, they're thinking about what you want because we can have, let's see if my PowerPoint's gonna come up now. <sighs> skipping, 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 back to where we were, okay? We can have 60 billion records on the site, but if we can't get you to the record you need, we haven't done our job. And so we are constantly thinking about that. How do we get you to the record that you need to make the discovery that you want to make? Now, along the way, I hope you find a whole bunch of other records that are happy accidents. <laughs> Rec tell me, you know about the rabbit holes, right? <laughs> okay, just making sure you're still awake. It's after lunch, I get it, okay? 
Like, I all the time go down a path and then end up finding out something delightful about somebody I'm not even really related to, <laughs> okay? Like, the rabbit holes are real. And we hope you make those kinds of discoveries, too, because sometimes they're just fun. But we also know that you're still looking for that one marriage record of your great-great-grandparents. And you're still looking to figure out what her maiden name is. And we want to make that as available to you as possible. So in addition to the 16 billion newspaper records, Ancestry has also continued to publish other records. As a matter of fact, there are about 2 billion additional records we published over the course of the last year. And if you haven't gone to the card catalog yet, I, you know I can't talk without talking about it. How many of you, before that word just came out of my mouth, did not know a card catalog existed on Ancestry? Hi, welcome to Ancestry. This is my favorite feature on our entire website, and here is why. Because when you're looking for that one record, you have to know, does it exist, and does it exist on Ancestry? Because if it exists, but it's not on Ancestry, I need to figure out where to find it. And if it doesn't exist, I need to stop wasting my time looking for it, or I need to figure out another way to get the information I'm looking for. And so, the card catalog is my favorite feature, because I can quickly come in here and I can see what exists on Ancestry. Now, the default sort on this is date added. I can change it to date updated, because here's one of the things Ancestry does. Not only do we publish new databases on a pre pretty regular cadence, but we also take existing databases and add records to them. So we add records to, right, this second one right here, France. Some France births, marriages, and deaths. We originally published this in February of 2022, but in February of 2024, we added records to this database. Now, the number one reason records get added to databases on Ancestry is because of privacy laws, right? Privacy laws say, oh, well, these records are private for 100 or 50 or 20 years, and as those privacy laws continue to ex not expire, but like move, right? We can get the new set of records for the last five years and the new set of records for the last five years. And so we just add them to the existing database and adjust the title to reflect that. So whenever you see this updated tag on Ancestry, those are new sets of records a lot of times that have been added to an existing collection. Anytime you see this new tag, that means that this is an entirely new database on Ancestry. Okay? And so you can see exactly um, when it was published and how many records are in that particular collection. I always love, I just heard this over here somewhere, I always love when I pull up the card catalog and I start scrolling through people, somebody goes, oh, they have that. <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> okay? Our content acquisition team, our content production team, this is what they do. And they're so very good at it. And so now, 60 billion records available on Ancestry. Still not everything in the world, but AI is certainly changing the rate at which we can get these digitized and indexed and made searchable for you faster. Okay, let's talk a little bit about DNA in our last few minutes. So uh, Ancestry this last year announced that we have now crossed the threshold of 25 million people who have taken the Ancestry DNA test. Uh, right? Okay. The billions of connections that that means, right? Some of you are math people. I am not a math people. <laughs> but some of you are math people. The amount of connections that that means that people are able to make is mind-boggling to me. Um, here's what else we're able to do. Ancestry has continued over the last 14 years since we, or nope, 12 years since we launched Ancestry DNA to update and refine the ethnicity estimate algorithms every year. So we launched a new update to the ethnicity estimates in the fall. So if you haven't checked your DNA results since then, get out your phone now. I, it's fine. I, you can do that, okay? Look at it. What happens is, as more people are added to the reference panel, we're able to refine those results. We're able to break out regions. So where we started 12 years ago with just 8, 10, 12 regions, we now have 88 different ethnicity regions around the world that we can give you percentages from. 
In addition to that, because Ancestry has 120 million family trees and 25 million people who've taken the Ancestry DNA test, our science team, who another brilliant group of people, and our data scientists have been able to use all of that data to start to find what we call DNA communities. So your ethnicity estimate is showing you where in the world your DNA was 500 to 1,000 years ago. And I don't know about you, but my tree does not go back that far. Like maybe on one line, but most of my tree does not go back that far. So the ethnicity estimate is super interesting, and it's a great way to get people to take the test. But the DNA communities, that is showing you, based on your genetic network of people you're related to, where you have family who have lived within the last 200 years. And Ancestry now has more than 2,500 of those communities. We have introduced this last year new communities, 203 of them in Ireland. It's a tiny little island. But 203 communities in Ireland that we can say you belong to. Guess where my brick wall is? And my mom's DNA now tells us that her great-grandfather that we have not been able to find, we know exactly what county he's from because of these DNA matches. And with a name like John O'Brien, <laughs> makes my eye twitch, I, I have to know where he's from in order to make any progress, and now we do. This last year, we also introduced 413 African-American communities in the southern United States and the Caribbean. So we're able to connect people with specific communities, and some of those communities go down to a 10-mile radius. You don't know where your family was enslaved. You don't know who they were connected to. DNA communities are going to start to narrow in on a specific place where you can go looking for records. And looking in a 10-mile radius in a county or two is going to be a lot more fruitful than trolling through an entire state's worth of census records trying to figure out who the enslaver family was. So that's been incredible. We've also introduced 352 Mexico communities over the last year. This coming year, we will also be releasing more. And I suspect what you'll see is more communities will be released about every hmm, three to four months-ish. So kind of keep an eye out for that. Because new communities are created as more people test and the, the scientists are able to de determine why that network of people exist, what, what they all have in common, where they're all from. Okay? That's one way that communities are created new. And then as more people test, your connection to that community, an existing community, may strengthen. So while we only release or launch new communities every three or four months or so, you can be pulled into an existing community at any time if just the right people have tested. So that's something you always want to be checking. Just check it out. It's in the same place as your ethnicity estimate. Just scroll down a smidge. Okay. Now, last year we also uh, introduced this new technology called Side View, where we're able to look at your DNA, and the short version is each of us inherited two chromosomes at each place. So chromosomes 1 through 22 are your autosomes. You, have, you got one of the pair from mom, one from dad. The problem is the DNA doesn't come labeled in your body, mom's side, dad's side. But we have been able to, with the massive amount of data we have, tease it apart so that we can at least tell this is one half of chromosome one, this is the other half, and we can present it to you in what we call parent one and parent two. Again, we don't know if parent one is your dad or your mom, but we're hoping you do. We're hoping you can look at your match list and say, oh, parent one is my uncle, that's my dad's brother, so parent one must be my dad. Or parent one says I'm from Mexico, in my ethnicity estimate, and, and my dad is Mexican. So that must be that side. So you can, and once you figure it out, you can label it and it cascades through the whole system. So last year we introduced ethnicity, as, um, parents by ethnicity, and we also introduced matches. This year what we have introduced now is par uh, traits by parent and communities by parent. So even without having a parent tested, you can go in and say, oh, I got this from mom and I got this from dad. Now, for me, I've tested both my parents. It was just a check. Ancestry got it right, so that's the good news, <laughs> okay? My dad, his mom had tested before she passed. 
and so it was easy to tell. But my mom, both her parents passed before she died. Or before, let me try that again. Both her parents passed before she tested. And she was able to look at that by parent split and see what she got from her dad and what she got from her mom. Um, and that's been really fascinating and gave us further evidence that this Irish community connected to her dad's side of the family is for his grandfather. So we're, we're, we're going to catch John O'Brien yet, y'all. Okay. <laughs> Um, there are um, a lot of other things happening at Ancestry, but I just want you to think about for a minute before I give you your final new announcement, is, um, is about who you're bringing along on that journey with you. I think that that's really an important concept because we're not going to be around forever. Um, and, and as much as we'd like to think that, and as young as some of us are or feel, um, we need to be thinking about what's next for our family history. Becoming good ancestors is an interesting perspective. Thinking about what I want to leave behind or how I want to pass that information on is best done for me when I do it in retrospect. So I think about, for example, the letters that were written by the younger sister of my three times great grandfather. He left the state of New York as a young man and he made his way across the United States, eventually joining the Mormon Battalion, going out to California with them, and then working his way back here to Utah, where he married and settled down, helped found a little town called Lehigh, which is where the ancestry headquarters are now. <laughs> and the connection that I feel to that community because of the stories I have heard about him and his wife my whole life was really great. But just a few months ago, I gained access to letters that his family had written him from New York, and somebody had kept them all. And then somebody had digitized them, and somebody put them online. And I found them. And one night, instead of doing DNA on our Sunday night call, because that's what we usually do, I read those letters to my dad like a bedtime story. And I have learned to love this ancestor even more, and his family, and my new Aunt Polly, because that's what I call his little sister, who died without ever having children of her own. But now I know her, and I love her. And so while I do not have children of my own, I think about that. What do I want my nibblings and their kids and their grandkids to know and discover about me? which means I need to be making decisions right now about how I preserve and share that information. So I hope you are thinking about those same things. One of the final things that I just want to share with you that Ancestry has done over the course of the last year is we've started introducing some new tools. Um, we're calling them pro tools, <laughs> but they're not really for professionals only, okay? What they are, are some new ways to view your family history. Because one of the things that happens, especially to a lot of us in an audience like this, is we've been doing family history for a while. I saw a lot of your hands go up. Or we have somebody in our family who's been doing family history for a while, and we're not quite sure what we can do. So one of the new things, and again, this is brand new just within the last couple of weeks, you're going to see over here is a little Pro Tools Shortcuts widget on your homepage. And it's going to give you a new way to get into some of the different ways to view your tree. Reports, charts, looking for errors, doing some advanced filters. There's a fan chart. There's a map. We love a good map. <laughs> okay? Um, but the idea is we want you to continue to engage in a way that shares this information, preserves this information, makes it available to others in your family. So... Uh, we'll be doing another presentation on Saturday afternoon. I think I'm one of the last hours of the conference. They stick me in that anchor spot, I think, because they think you'll stick around if you have to want to come hear me. But, um, but they'll, that last Saturday presentation hour, I'll be talking with Ann Mitchell a little bit more about our Pro Tools. Or again, you can come visit us in the Ancestry booth to hear from the product managers directly, to ask your questions, to get on the computer, to find out. Because again, I work with brilliant people. And I want you to get to know them just as much as you get to know me, because I think we've got a lot that we can offer to your family history journey. Thank you.